It's, it's, it's way too sentient. In a moment, it'll just go, yes, I am, or something. Anyway, um, that's a really useful tool for when you're giving presentations. If you're doing screen recording and things like that, it will show up, and you don't have to do much. Uh, so yeah, welcome to the first time contribution workshop. And uh, I hope everybody is feeling rested and caffeinated and not at all tired from all the partying. Before we get started on all of the slides and talking about all the different ways that we can contribute, um, I'd just like to remind everybody that a lot of the communications that we're doing, uh, maybe not always face-to-face -face anymore, especially when people are wearing masks and stuff. Sometimes it can be harder to hear or you know, people want to have some personal space. So we are using Slack a lot for, you know, for talking, for sharing things. So if you haven't already gone on to the Drupal Slack, if you can go to drupal.org slash Slack and get on to the drupal.org Slack um, account, and then for the purposes of this event, we'll have a channel called first-contribution, which is where you will be talking about the contribution efforts that you'll be making today and going forwards the next few days. Hopefully. So uh, yeah, hi. My name is Chris Dark, and my username on Slack is Chris Dark, and my do my triple dog account is Chris Dark. So it should be fairly easy. Um, I speak English and Spanish. Any other languages out there? I'd have to, you know, get out a, an app or something. Um, these slides. Don't worry about photographing things or writing tons of things down because you can just access the slides with that link or with bit.ly slash decon24pdx. So there's going to be a lot of resources on these slides. There's embedded links in the slides that you can click on afterwards. Uh, so feel free to grab that, but try not to you know, get focused on the slides when I'm talking. You, know, you can look at them afterwards. Um, and yeah, any questions you have for me, you can reach out to me. Or you can reach out to one of the other mentors who they might be in this room sometimes. We're all wearing t-shirts that say mentor on the back. I think Amy June is around here somewhere. Amy June, have you? yeah, she's right outside. But uh, she's going to be lingering. And if you've got any questions, you put your hand up, somebody will come over. So what do we do during mentored contribution? So during mentored contribution, which is happening downstairs, and you will hopefully go and join after this, we find the table to work on together on an issue with other people. We join this team of people. It might be people that you know or just strangers who will be friends soon, hopefully. And you find an issue to work on. We'll be showing you ways to find these issues. And also, people downstairs will help you find them. So once we have an issue, we will update the issue and say you know, that we're working on this issue during DrupalCon. Um, then there'll be a bit of a division of labor. Everybody will split up the task into a few different pieces, and we can all just try the different parts of the task. Then we'll be keeping the issues up to date, so sort of saying, oh, I'm still working on this. It's you know, 2 PM, almost got it finished. Um, and after the event is over, the idea is that you keep contributing, that you keep working on the issue if it's not being resolved, um, or that you just find other areas of contribution, and that it, this encourages you to keep contributing going forwards. So what we're going to be talking about during this workshop is why do we contribute, the benefits of contributing, um, the forms in which we can contribute, the initiatives, which are the different um, structured uh, it, you know, collections of tasks that they have determined are things that really need to get worked on, and you've probably heard them mentioning initiatives all week. The issue queue, which is where we track most things to do. Uh, merge requests, which is how we push in new changes into the code base and some other areas. Uh, tooling and documentation, which is how we can 
do testing and uh, encoding and other things like that. So this should describe you in the room. You are new to the world of Drupal, or you've been around forever, but you've never gotten around to doing any contribution. Or you've done a load of contribution, but you want to try a different form of contribution, and you're not sure what to do. Uh, you've done a load of contribution, but there's some changes to the processes, and you want to get up to date with what those processes are. So basically, anybody. Anybody is welcome at these sessions, and uh, it should cover everybody at the conference. So why do we contribute? So the whole premise of open source is you know, you depend on the open source, but the open source depends on you. If it's just a production and consumption model, uh, there's going to be a few people working on it and everybody else is using it. That's not how open source can move forwards. Um, your contributions are really valued. So we have all of these different experiences, all these different skill sets, and they all can be used to contribute back in different varied ways. You might think that you don't have much to contribute, but it's, uh, you, you do. Um, also, contribution makes you a really valued part of the Drupal community. It allows you to bond and connect with other people that you may never otherwise meet, and you help move the whole project forwards, and it's um, you know, keeping everything moving like they're talking about with the Starshot program, you know, just trying to get to the moon. So, one of the things that we have talked about sometimes with agencies uh, where they're like, oh, well, I don't see why we should contribute back because, you know, there's no value in it for us. Um, basically, if you ha are an agency or you work at an agency, you should really encourage them to get into contribution because there's a huge amount of uh, skills that you can acquire by doing contribution. Um, but also, Drupal depends, again, on all of this work. And it, you know, if you want to have these great tools to use at work, they need fostering and they need building. And also, you know, the people at, the, uh, at work, they like to come to events and meet other people and you know, get free t-shirts. Who doesn't like free t-shirts, right? Anyways, back to what you need to get started. Um, one of the first things you need to do is get a Drupal.org account. If you haven't got one already, please go to Drupal.org slash user slash register to sign up and get a Drupal.org account. If you do that today, you will probably not get verified right away because it takes a few days and you might get marked as, you know, frozen, which means you can't do certain things. Uh, it's just like a spam protection system. So if you do find that your account is frozen, pardon me, uh, reach out to one of us mentors, and there's a few of us who can uh, verify you as a, as a real human being, and we can just get that sorted out. And uh, what do we have on the Drupal.org profile? Well, it's kind of like a resume, right? So you've got your username, your real name, if you want, your you know, work, where do you work, um, profile photo, You've got social links, and you can also list your mentors. So if you are getting mentored today, for example, um, let's say that Matt downstairs, Matt Radcliffe, is mentoring you, you could put Matt Radcliffe in as one of your mentors, and you can, you know, you, you link up like that. It's kind of like LinkedIn or something. And I would just like to remind you that this is not a code thing specifically. A lot of people think, oh, I don't, I can't contribute because I'm not a coder. This is nothing about coding. This is about contributing, and there's a ton of different ways of contributing. And some of our most prolific contributors are non-code contributors, right? So you can be a huge asset to the project without ever touching any code. There's a lot of forms of contribution, like documentation, issue triage, translations, reviewing content, marketing, event organizations, um, and sharing knowledge. Like some of the stuff that we do as mentoring coordinators, we do event organization and mentoring. Um, when you're doing code contributions, you can be doing things like 
testing, um, testing experimental features that are in a specific page where they list experimental features, uh, creating merge requests, like creating code changes, doing code reviews, providing feedback on other people's code changes. And um, for the first part, the non-code contribution, one of the biggest areas that we need work with is documentation. So the documentation URL, documentation, uh, sorry, Drupal.org slash documentation would be very useful for you for both doing any, contri in any contribution where you need to look something up, but also as an avenue for contributing. If you go into documentation and you see something is wrong or you see something is missing, you can actually submit um, you know, new documentation. Within the documentation, there's some official guides. These are governed by the maintainers and they're somewhat curated. Um, these are the Drupal user guide, the evaluator guide, and the local development guide. And these would be useful for reference. There is a way to edit them if you see that there's a, a mistake or there's something missing. But it's somewhat cumbersome in that you have to create an ASCII doc and change and submit it to an issue. And um, it's not like a wiki experience. But there is a way. There's links. Uh, these are... Uh, that text appears at the bottom of all of those curated guides, so you can follow through the links. Then there's the community guides, which is a bit more of a wiki sort of experience. And the community documentation can be freely edited by anybody with a Drupal.org account. Um, there's the Drupal guide, which is sort of catch-all guide for 8, 9, and later. There's the developer guide, which is like um, tools, processes, and standards. Uh, there's the Drupal APIs guide, which covers all the different APIs. And when you go into some of the community documentation, or, uh, any of the wiki style documentation, you should be able to see an edit button at the top. So if you see there's a typo or there's like, you know, an outdated piece of code, you can click on there and edit it and put in your justification. And that's really valuable because we still have a load of stuff missing. You know, people say, oh, I see this documentation for Drupal 7, but where is it for Drupal 10? It's like, it hasn't been made for some reason. Uh, so yeah, it's really valuable contribution. Bear in mind, if you do edit something and you do put in a load of rubbish just to be silly, you might get banned. So yeah, bear that in mind. Um, so there is also documentation within the contrib modules. Uh, it could be external documentation pages that are hosted somewhere or internally within the repo. Uh, so that's another area of documentation. And then there's the Drupal.org documentation, which includes you know, how to deal with user accounts, content guidelines, marketing guidelines, things like that. Um, and that is also you know, editable wiki style. One of the other areas that still needs a lot of work is translations. Localize.drupal.org is where the translations are tracked. And if you go to the translations page, you can uh, sign up to a specific language that you happen to know. Uh, you can join a team. You read the documentation that's being written about how to do the translations and about what's needed. You can find, for example, a, a text snippet that maybe exists in English but doesn't exist in that language. Um, and then you can translate it. You can review other people's translations. And there's a couple of roles. You can be a translator or translator moder translation moderator. Um, and those are still very valuable contributions. Some languages, like Spanish, are pretty much complete. But there's a lot of languages that are you know, maybe only 10% complete. So in terms of, and that's just Drupal core. So in terms of um, you know, loading up. Drupal core and switching to another language, you might see a lot of stuff still in English because it's just never been translated. One of the other areas of contribution is the uh, Drupal Association. So Drupal.org slash association, you can go and become a member. It has a small, well, not necessarily that small, but it's, a, it's got a fee. Um, and that is a economic, um, you know, financial contribution back to the Drupal Association. They, you know, do a lot for us, and like this event is run by the Drupal Association. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. So that's also a very valuable area of contribution. 
marketing. Uh, you might have heard during uh, the Dries note they were talking about, you know, Starshot and all that and trying to promote Drupal. Uh, so community slash promote dash Drupal is where you can find out about different ways of promoting, uh, talking about uh, Drupal at different events, sharing articles on social media, um, talking during tech events, all sorts of ways in which you can spread the word about Drupal. Um, and it is for all sorts of different skill sets, right? So you might be you know, a video producer and you want to create new videos where you talk about Drupal or a uh, you know, graphic artist or a copywriter, um, all sorts. Um, so yeah, in, within the Promote Drupal initiative, uh, there's information about um, tasks that involve presentations. Like these presentations, they don't look that great to be honest <laughs> because we work on them and we aren't you know, graphic artists or whatever. So uh, if anybody is great at designing really sl slick presentations, hey, come talk to me. Um, social media, photography, like you might see some people going around taking photos. A lot of those people are just you know, volunteering their time and contributing in that. Uh, logo design, for example, we've recently, for the Project Browser Initiative, needed a load of logos created. Uh, so that's been a big effort. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of different roles and tasks in terms of marketing. Uh, so we've got like project leads, writers, designers, videographers, communication teams, and uh, there's also the Drupal Recording Initiative. Um, so there's a lot of different skill sets that you can bring here that might have nothing to do with the actual website, but they're to do with all of the other areas. Um, the Drupal Recording Initiative, we are currently recording this, for example, this uh, uh, screen share. My voice is being recorded in a little box around the side, and the Drupal Recording Initiative is um, very valuable during all of the different Drupal cons and camps, and uh, Basically, we need more people to get trained up on having these devices so that we can just take along and plug in and press a bit red button and it records and then it gets uploaded later on. Uh, so if you volunteer to become a, a you know, Drupal recording um, member, then you would uh, get some, inf you know, you get all of this training about all of these different areas of, uh, of recording these events. So, Issue queue. The issue queue is one of the primary ways in which we actually track things to do. It's not necessarily issues. Issue might sound like a problem. It's a task list, basically. Some of them will be problems, bugs, things like that. But some of them are just you know, tasks. Even like when we plan meetings, we, put them, we create an issue for the meeting. Um, and the issue queue is how we find things to do, and it's also how we report when we need something to be done. So there's a distinct uh, difference between core and contrib, and I'm sure you, if you don't know, already know what it is, um, then core is the core of Drupal. It's the, the foundation that everything runs upon, and you can install Drupal core on its own. If you download Drupal, you would just get core. And then for most, most of us, we already need like you know, 20 or so contrib modules just to get started as well because there's a ton of features that are in contrib. Um, and contrib itself is distributions and themes and recipes and modules and things like that that basically decorate Drupal core. Um, during these events, we are gonna be looking just at things, uh, issues within Drupal core and there's a separate issue queue for each of these items. So there's an issue queue for core, there's an issue queue for each module, there's an issue queue for each theme, so on. So the issue queue that we're gonna be talking about today is the Drupal core issue queue. Sorry, is there anybody here for the branding initiative? That's in the next room. You might be in the wrong room. If you're here for the branding initiative, you're in the wrong room, apparently. If not, stay here. Feel free to blame 
uh, Aaron Winborn Award winner Amy June at the back for directing people to the wrong place. Did you say Aaron Winborn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy June sent people to the wrong place apparently. Great. Um, so anyways, moving on. Uh, basically, yeah, so issue queues are a community to-do list and all projects have them. So, you know, we can put in there like bugs and suggestions and uh, tasks and all sorts. And it's where we would report an issue, we would update these issues, we can triage them, which means, you know, go through and determine whether something is still valid, whether it's important, whether it's less important, so on. Uh, it's where we can create merge requests, so changes to code. It's where we can provide feedback, so, you know, comments on somebody else's changes, and it's where we can test things. So, issue Q101, I'm not gonna go into 101 uh, items, thankfully, but uh, there's quite a few slides, so I'll try and go through them fast. But, um, yeah, the Drupal core issue queue is, if you go to drupal.org slash uh, project slash issues slash Drupal. Don't worry about typing that URL. I'm going to give you a shorter one in a moment. Uh, if you go from the download and extend page, it will be on the right hand side. There's like a gray box and it says all tasks, all open bugs and so on. And you can click on those and it'll take you through to the issue queue. Uh, but there's also for the purposes of these events, there's a bit.ly short URL, which is bit.ly slash Drupal dash novice. And that will take you directly to the issue queue for core with the novice tag applied. And I'll go into tagging in a moment. So in the issue queue, we'll see a search box at the top with a couple of filters. Then we'll see each of the issues listed with a title, a status, a priority, a category, a version, component, number of replies, a last updated sort, um, assigned to, which should almost always be blank on these, and the created. So we can, using that information, we can try to find something that is maybe easy to work on, or if we're trying to find a report of something that we've seen, we can use it to try and find if it's already been reported. There's an advanced search at the top, so if you click on that, it extends out some more filters. And so once you get the more filters, you can filter it by uh, status, priority, category, version, component, so on. So there's a lot more filters that you can apply there. There's basically a lot of issues that are quite complex and that have been going on for a long time. I think you might have heard, uh, I think Dries, no, uh, Dries mentioned some issues that have been around for seven years and they've, you know, increased the number of, um, they've added some bounties and then people have gotten around to actually getting, getting them sorted out. I've certainly worked on some issues that were more than seven years old. Uh, it's like, you know, 20 pages of comments. It's not fun. Um, those are probably not the ones you want to work on if you've never worked on one of these before. But uh, yeah, you want to avoid, if you're working on a contrib thing, you want to work, uh, avoid working on something that's not maintained anymore. Um, you don't want to work on an issue that has loads of won't fix, or issues that are to do with like Drupal 7, for example, is maybe not a good one to work on right now. Issues with over 20 comments, if there's a lot of comments going on, it might not be a great one to work on. There's exceptions to that, but if you see a ton of comments, it might be hard to parse what's going on. Um, things that have changed state a lot of times. So if it's gone from, you know, needs work to reviewed and tested by the community to back to needs work for some reason, um, and it's been flipping around, then maybe there's something a bit more complex that hasn't really been communicated properly. Something that's critical maybe is not the best thing to work on versus something that's normal or minor. Uh, normally, if it's critical, it's probably a bit more complex. But yeah, we can see all of those all those pieces of information within that list, so we can use it to make a, a choice as to which ones to click into and look at. Um, I'll get back to some of the details of the issue in a minute, but uh, yeah, merge requests. 
as of November 2020, we are not using patches anymore, or we shouldn't be using patches anymore. We should be using merge requests. But you will see issues with patches in them, and you'll see issues with merge requests in them, and you'll see both. Uh, there's actually a video on our video series, which we'll be linking to later on, which goes into how you do merge requests. But I'll show you in a sec um, some information about it. But uh, basically, it's using a Git process to create a fork and then branch off that and make a change and then push it back in. So how is an issue structured? So we have the title, which is actually really important. When you're scrolling through a load of issues, you want it to be obvious what the issue is about. You don't want to have to click into the issue to try and figure out what it's about. You want the title to be pretty descriptive, but not too long. Uh, category, which will indicate if it's a task or bug or feature. Uh, priority, so you know if it's something that is of you know high importance or not to other issues. Uh, status, so it might be um, the different life cycle of, this, of the issue. It might be, you know, needs work, it might be active, it might be closed. Um, the version, so, you know, we, during these events, we try to stick to, you know, Drupal, the latest versions, or it might be 10 or 11. Uh, we try and steer away from really old versions because they've probably not been fixed for a reason. Uh, components, so there's lots of different components that you can work on. There's like, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, you might want to look at the Ajax uh, components. If you're a documentation person, you might want to look at you know, documentation components. Um, tags, so as I mentioned before, we've got lots of tags that you can filter by. During these events, we curate a list of issues that are good to work on, and they are normally tagged as novice, and they're also tagged with the event name. And the event tag for this event is Portland 2024. When you go downstairs and you go and do a mentored contribution, they'll be reminding you of all these things and helping you find them. But that's how we would tag for curated issues for this event. But there's all sorts of other tags, right? So for example, there's a needs documentation tag. So if you see something that says needs documentation as a tag, you go, oh, OK, that one might be something I can work on. Um, you can also search upon those tags, obviously. Um, there's the assigned data, which you don't really want to assign anything to yourself in core. Basically, in contrib, you can assign an issue to yourself if you're working on it, but in core, you can comment that you're working on it, but we ask you not to assign it to yourself. Uh, and then there's the summary, and the summary contains all sorts of information about the issue. So uh, yeah, there you can see, for example, in this case, this issue has a needs, or it needs to have a needs documentation tag. If you are tagging an issue, one thing to bear in mind is that if you just type blah de blah de blah, it will create a tag called blah de blah de blah, and it will be forever in the system until somebody goes and deletes it. Um, so if you do that, and somebody might call you out on why you created that tag, right? Um, when you create the tag, let it autocomplete, and then unless you've got a good reason for creating a new tag, choose one of the existing tags. That goes the same if you see an issue, for example, that you think, oh, this is actually a great Portland 2024 issue. Feel free to tag it, but make sure it says Portland 2024 and not Portland space 2024 or Portland dash 2024, because we'll end up with multiple tags. Um, if you do create a tag, you're going to be creating a comment on the issue that says why you created that tag. That's fine. So the issue summary is the, a really critical part for the issue. So if you're reading an issue and you want to understand what you need to do on it, or you're creating an issue and you need to know how to put your, um, your information in there, uh, this is where you would focus that. There's the summary templates. So you can choose different kinds of templates, and we can go into those in a sec. But basically, you'd be covering the problem or motivation. You know, like, oh, I see a problem. I see a visual uh, issue on this page. Uh, the steps to reproduce, go to this page, look at the footer. Uh, proposed resolution, oh, change the color of this uh, div. 
uh, remaining tasks, change the color, do some tests, create some screenshots, test again. Um, UI and API changes, so okay, it's a UI change, I need to change the color for this div so that it's visible. Data model changes, if there's some, put them in there. Uh, as we said, there's different templates, so you can have a, sort of a bare template, a documentation one, there's initiative proposals, they all have different headings, and so if you choose one of those templates, you can click on it, and it will fill in the placeholders in the summary, and then that will give you an idea of what you need to fill in. Obviously, if there's a bit within the summary that you don't have it yet, you can just put TBD. So, in the guide, you know, in the summary, you should be able to understand fairly clearly what the issue is, and that goes again. If you're looking at an issue and it's not clear, then maybe one of the tasks is to actually look at the issue and go, okay, I've spent a while reading through the comments. I now understand what the issue is. I should update the issue summary. So, uh, yeah, somebody's got a hand up over there. Thanks. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where the contribution you might be trying to do to resolve the issue is a great part of it, but also fixing the issue to make it more clear is also a great, you know, contribution. Um, so it should be short, clear sentences in the summary. We can use markup, for example, if we want to include a piece of code or some, you know, styling or something. Um, it should identify the key points, so, you know, use bullet, you know, numbered lists and things like that. Uh, links to particular comments. So say there's a comment on another issue and you're referring to it, put a link in there. UI and API changes, if you, you know, as again, if you're not ready for them yet, but you know there's gonna be some, put in TBD. And um, yeah, one of the important things within the issue apart from the summary is just being transparent, right? So you wanna be transparent about what you are planning to do with the issue. If you've just created an issue, for example, and you don't have a solution, just create the issue, and you know somebody hopefully will work on it. But if you've already got the solution, and you're just creating the issue to track it, and to put the, the merge request in, you could put, create the issue, and then immediately put a comment saying, I have the, the fix for this, I'm just, you know, just putting it up. Uh, in this case, when we're working on issues today during the mentor contribution, you wanna be putting down uh, a comment saying, you know, this is your first time doing a contribution. Um, you are gonna say like, oh, I'm, I can contribute during this event today, or I can contribute during the, for the whole weekend. Uh, but just be clear about what you're planning to do with the issue. If, as I said before, if you create a new tag for some reason, so you create blah de blah de blah it could be that it's a really relevant, valuable, you know, tag that has something to do with a module that's called bloody bloody blah, blah, and we just don't know about it, right? So just right in there, I created the tag for this reason. Um, if you're working on the issue with somebody else, make sure that everybody is commenting on the issue together. Uh, if it's somebody that's helping you but they aren't able to comment on it, at least put the username in, in your comment. And if you happen to be assigning an issue to yourself for some reason, again, for core you shouldn't be, but if you are, put a comment and say why you're doing that, in case there's like an off, uh, you know, like an odd case where that's needed. And uh, yeah, etiquette is also very important on the issue queue. So we do need to remember to report an issue in the right project, right? So sometimes you might see a problem and you think you can report it into core and it turns out it's part of paragraphs or something like that. Uh, make sure you actually read all the documentation before you create an issue. Investigate whether or not the issue's already been fixed in a different version. So if you search through the issue queue and you see, oh, this looks similar to mine, you can check it. Okay, it's already been fixed. It's just not been deployed yet. Um, if you actually have the issue, you can load up the latest version of Drupal and see if it's still a problem. And also reach out to the community. Remember Slack? If you go onto the Drupal Slack and go to one of the different channels, you can go to, for example, um, say it's a composer issue, you can go to the composer channel. If it's, you can go to the contribute channel, which is the main contribution channel, and you can ask on there. Um, 
many different channels where you can reach out to people. Say it's the project browser, you can go to the project browser initiative and uh, ask a question on there. So lots of different areas where you can ask people in case there is actually already a solution for that before you go and create an issue. Um, again, you search the issue queue to see if there's anything similar. And then if there isn't, you provide a full description. So make it clear what's happening. And if you do find a fix, make sure you come back to your issue and actually report that. If, you, if there was actually no change needed and you just realized that it was like, oh, I needed to select some option and clear my cache, put that in. Because people will be searching on these things and that will help other people. Um, when you are tagging, again, remember to use the autocomplete. And there's actually a link on that slide as to the guidelines for when to assign an issue to yourself, which is not many for core, but for contrib it might be. And uh, remember, if you are not a novice user, this doesn't um, apply to, you know, it applies to everybody. Uh, once you've worked on a couple of issues, you might go, oh, okay, I know what the process is now. Um, leave other novice issues to other people who've never worked on an issue before. Um, we sometimes do get a problem where companies will use up, you know, they'll fix all of the novice issues and get lots of issue credit. Uh, we try to put some comments in to say, please don't work on these if you aren't. But um, yeah, it still happens. So things not to do. Don't report a security issue in the general Drupal issue queue. So if you do see something that allows people to backdoor into any Drupal site and destroy everything, don't report that on the public issue queue. There's actually a separate uh, sec security issue reporting procedure. And um, yeah, that should be available in the documentation. You can also reach out to somebody on the, I think there's a security channel on Slack. Um, don't hijack other issues by sort of straying off topic and asking different questions about other things that aren't related to the issue. Create a separate issue if you have that. Um, don't mark an issue as reviewed and tested by the community if you haven't actually reviewed and tested it does happen sometimes. Um, so, you know, check if you are testing a piece of a code change or, you know, like a merge request, check they actually solve the problem and, you know, if you can create a screenshot or something like that and then, um, then you can mark it as reviewed and tested. Uh, don't change text files to markdown files. So basically there's a lot of cases where we used to have readmes and things like that as text files and then people would just change them to markdown and it looks really unreadable. There's this a whole different syntax for markdown files. So again, if you're sharing a text file on an issue as a file, um, try to reformat it if you're gonna do that. Um, yeah, so don't just change uh, status of an issue from fix to close fix. Those are different issue uh, states and one automates to another. So uh, leave it as fixed. Don't open a merge request or upload a patch on a fixed or closed issue. Basically, if it's been fixed, doesn't need another merge request. Um, yeah, that just confuses the system, I think. Um, also, don't create an empty fork. So if you know that you need to work on something and you just go and open a fork and you don't create a branch on it, we'll go into that in a, sorry, in a minute. Um, it's again, it's confusing because somebody else will go in and look and it's like, oh, there's nothing in here. So you've probably been hearing a lot about AI in the last week. Um, there's a lot of use of AI in development and in other areas. In you know, uh, copywriting, for example. Uh, I know that I personally have used uh, generative AI in Illustrator, for example, to create some graphics for a website. That was a, like, just an example. And um, if we do use AI and we're using it within uh, an issue where we are actually providing a solution to something, we do want to be very careful about it. So if you're using AI, like uh, ChatGPT to create the code snippet, be very clear that you, you've generated this with a generative tool. Um, review it really carefully and test the output because the whole garbage in, garbage out concept applies very much to AI and there's a lot of garbage on Stack Overflow which gets punted straight in and out again. Um, not that everything on Stack Overflow is garbage, there's tons of really valuable stuff, but some of it isn't. 
And so really review and test it, you know, go through, check for inaccuracies, mistakes, broken code, things like that, right? Um, and yeah, just be clear that you use generative AI in some of that work. And if you are using AI in bulk to bulk update tons of issues, you probably will get banned. So FYI. Um, and I mentioned tools earlier on. So yeah, drupal.org slash tools is where you can find information about all the different tools. And uh, we have one of the main ones, which is DrupalPod. And that is the one that we will be using if you don't already have a, a development environment, if that's what you're gonna use. Um, so DrupalPod is based upon Gitpod, and it allows you to have a full development stack on your browser. It's also useful if you're just doing testing. So if you aren't a developer and you just wanna check a change, you can use DrupalPod to spin up that change on your machine and you can preview it and share that preview with others. There's also local development environments that are listed there. So DDEV, Locker, Lando, Docsal, those are all, use, you know, you can use any of those. Um, if you already have something that I installed, that's great. Uh, we've got Tugboat, which we use for live previews. So if you go onto one of the uh, issues, you might see a live preview on there. Let me actually just uh, switch to that. So this is an actual issue. And if we scroll down, we can see there's an issue fork here. And this one does not have a live preview right now. But if it did, it would actually tell you there's a live preview that you can view, but it does say it's mergeable. Um, so if you see down there, it says live preview, uh, you can click on that and it should spin up a version of the site with the change that's been suggested. Um, this one also has patches, which is the old way of doing things. So you'll still see patches and merge requests at the same time. Just FYI, if you see that, don't worry. These things still get used, but we're trying to move away from them. <coughs> so apart from Tugboat, um, we also have simplytest.me. That is, allows you to spin up a version of Drupal. You, you can select and you can even add like contrib modules to it and a patch, for example, and it will spin up the site on your browser and you can preview it. There is sometimes some hardware issues with the, the cloud side of that, and sometimes it takes a long time to load or it doesn't load properly. So bear that in mind, if it's not loading on Simply Test Me and there's no tugboat preview, it might be a case that you can spin it up in DrupalPod. But we'll go into DrupalPod in a second. So yeah, as I said, DrupalPod is a uh, extension of Gitpod, which is basically like a cloud environment. It runs off DDEV. You can download uh, the DrupalPod extension for Chrome or Firefox. You would go to drupalpod.org, I think it is. I, I have the URL in the next slide. You would go to any um, issue page on drupal.org. So it could be a core issue or a contrib issue. And you would select the DrupalPod extension at the top of the, you know, your browser bar. And it allows you to select different patches or different forks and then, and different um, profiles. And then you can just spin up this development environment with xdebug or PHP storm, uh, with live previews, with um, VS code as well, sorry. Um, and you can share that URL with others. So if you're testing something, you can share the URL and they can see the, the site live. You can also share your whole development environment with others. So you can share the workspace that you're on and other people can do you know, changes to what you're working on. You will need a GitHub account, I believe, still. And you will need a Drupal.org account for these things. So here's a little video I made before about DrupalPod because I don't want to actually have to go through the whole thing live. Uh, it does sometimes take a moment to load. So drupalpod.com, that's the URL. That just redirects to the GitHub account, GitHub uh, page. And then you can see I've already got the extension installed. So I don't need to install it again, but it's up there at the top. It's like a little um, wing. And yeah, this issue is a sample issue. It's got a fork, an issue fork. And if 
I click on the Drupal pod, it gives me a choice to load the branch for that fork, and I choose the version that the issue is on, and I choose the profile standard in this case. And then I'm going to log in with GitHub, and I'm already logged in, so that's why it does that. And then it's asking me to authenticate with Drupal. So my Drupal.org account is now authorizing it. And then there's a few other choices. You can choose which editor you use. Um, there's a certain hardware that you can select, but if you just keep the standards, that, that's fine. Then it will create the workspace. And this can take a moment. I do speed up the video in a sec. Um, let me move this. So it just starts to compile and run ddev basically behind the scenes. And um, I should have made this video shorter. Apologies. I made it very last minute. But uh, yeah, it pulls down all of the tools that it needs. And uh, in previous events, we've had people trying to get an environment set up for two and a half hours and then giving up. So this is not too bad. But yeah, there we go. Uh, it, the script has run. Now the browser pops up there. So you can pull that into a separate tab or whatever. But that's the Drupal site there, and you've got your instructions on the left, and then you've got your file system on the far left. And in this example, there is no code because it's an empty project, but uh, yeah, if you had something else, you'd, you would see the different modules in there as well. Um, but yeah, you can actually share the workspace, the running workspace, um, and there's documentation in there and things like that. So it's quite powerful. And there's actually a video which we have on the video list at the end, which goes in depth into all of these things. Bear in mind that the videos that we made were made during COVID. So it was for all the virtual events. So some of the stuff might be slightly out of date in terms of the versions mentioned and things like that, but it's still relevant. Again, if you are a video editor and you want to help out with that sort of thing, give me a shout because uh, I'm really slow at doing it. Um, the other thing that we mentioned is the forking and merge requests, which we saw on that other slide. So basically, we create an issue fork, which is a fork of the whole Drupal project. Then we create a branch on that fork, which is specific to the task that you're doing, and it would have your, the issue number and a short description in it. Then you make the changes on that fork, on that um, branch, and you would commit those changes with a meaningful message, and then you create a merge request, and basically, if everything goes successfully, then that branch would get merged in back into the project, and you would uh, see that change happening in core. Um, so again, uh, how did I end up there? Oh, OK. So if you go into. If you go into a branch on an issue fork, you basically get uh, here, you can see the code. You can actually do, um, live editing. You can edit on the IDE. You can edit here on the page. Um, you've got your merge requests here. If you need them, you've got your branches. So you can make all of these changes right there on the, on the site. But there's also commands, which are here, if you want to pull these branches down onto your local machine and run the, do these changes locally, right? So you can either make these changes, for example, in Drupal pod, or you can make them on your local machine, or you can even make them in the browser right there. If it's like a documentation thing, for example, you can go in, make the documentation change, commit it, and you're done. And for all of this sort of stuff, if you have any questions, you can reach out to any one of us and we'll help you go through it. So there is some strategic initiatives. I'm not going to go into them in depth, but there's a link there to the strategic initiatives and you can read about them. Project Browser was a big one. Then we've got the community initiatives, and that's a list of all of the um, more community-driven initiatives that we've got, like um, uh, all of the events for, sorry, the initiatives for running events and things like that. So all, those are two areas where you can contribute a lot. 
and uh, there's a lot of information in those, and I don't really have time to go into them. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, the contribution videos uh, where we cover a lot of these topics, um, feel free to watch these. It's just a YouTube playlist. If you have any questions about any of the videos, you can reach out to us. There should be um, one for every one of the topics, I think. So we've got issue forking, for example. We've got documentation, non-code contribution, uh, code contributions, development tools, DrupalPod, all of that has a separate video. They're fairly short. They should be within like five and eight minutes long each, so they're fairly easy to consume. There's links to each of the separate videos there, but you can also, if you go to the previous uh, link, bit.ly slash Drupal dash contribute, you should j just get a playlist and you can watch them you know, all the way through. Um, there's other resources on these slides. So you've got your issue queue etiquette, triaging, reporting issues, issue summary fields, extending Drupal, issue tags, all that sort of stuff is listed as links on this slide. So if you go to the link, which is gonna be at the end as well, you can load all of those and get through to all those resources. So yeah, thanks for attending. Uh, that's the end of this workshop. Uh, there's plenty more information that we can provide you, but we don't have enough time to run it right now. But if you ask any of the mentors, they'll re you know, they can help you. All the mentors will have mentor on the back on the back of the t-shirts. And um, downstairs in B113 um, is where the mentor contribution space is. And there, there's gonna be a lot of people to help you out, answer more questions. Again, we can field some questions in a moment. But uh, yeah, thanks for being here. There's a link to the slides if you need it again. And um, thank you very much. So there's a microphone that's gonna go around if anybody's got any questions. Is it on? Yes. Right, the microphone is on. Anybody questions? We had some good questions yesterday. Let's see, come on. Okay. Oh, there's one. <laughs> Let's make him run. <laughs> if the next oh, question could be at the furthest corner as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving, moving from patches to uh, forks, how will that work with just temporary fixes, like patches that have kept us going for issues for years? If, we, if they're in forks, w will that change the ability? So, yeah, so if we have patches that we apply in Composer, is that what you mean? Right, so as some of you might know, if you have a patch for an issue and it's never been you know, committed into core and you, you can actually apply it into your composer file on your mo in, your, in your project and it will therefore apply in your code and you don't have to worry about it. Now, the question is, with merge requests, what happens with that? Well, if it's an existing patch, it's not gonna go anywhere, no one's gonna delete it, but going forwards, if you make a merge request and you don't create a patch, you can actually just auto-generate a patch from the merge request by just putting .diff or .patch on the end of the URL, and it will automatically create a patch file. So in the composer, if you just take that, you know, if you just take that URL of the diff of the merge request and put .patch on it, it will work in fine in composer patches. Any other questions? Make him run, come on, come on. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just to add to what you just said, which is a great tip. Download that patch that you get that you get by adding .diff, and then put that download in your composer. And then when the merge request changes, the stuff you're pulling into your composer won't change. Yes. Good tip. Okay, there's one over there. Thank you for making them nice and far apart. That's, that's great. He, need, he was saying he didn't get a workout. Hey, I created. Okay. Hey, uh, created an issue about six months ago. Um, then I created a patch and a branch and a merge request. And um, what can I do to get that reviewed by uh, the contrib maintainer? Because there hasn't been any traction on that. Yeah, traction on issues is sometimes difficult. 
Um, the question was, how do I get traction on an issue that has been created and has been, you know, merge request has been created, but it's, you know, stuck. Um, if it's in needs review and it's got the right tags on it and it's got a clear description and it's got clear testing steps, then the next step after that would be to maybe identify somebody in one of the Slack channels for whatever it is that the issue is about and reach out to them and say, oh, hey, I've got this, this merge request for this problem. Um, can somebody go and take a look at it? Uh, just talking to people is basically a, a great way of getting people to actually review things. Uh, sometimes things just fly under the radar and nobody notices them. If it's like a, an issue that has never affected anybody else but yourself for some reason, it's like a really edge case, maybe somebody's never looked for it. If it's something that somebody else has looked for and they've found it and they've applied it, they might just go, okay, this works for me and I'll update it. Uh, but in many cases, if, if it's something that is rather edge case, it maybe just never gets noticed. So reaching out to people and asking for a review is actually, you know, really great. And one of the things that you can do is, if it's a simple task that somebody during this event can look at, you can actually make that a good mentored contribution task, is to review your patch. If I can clarify, that was for a contrib project, right? So it, there is a process for abandoned projects if nobody gets back or puts your patch in. Right, if, if the whole module is, yeah, if, if it's a maintainer that is not getting back to you and you've reached out to them, then there's, yes, there's a separate process. If nobody is actually updating that module anymore, then you can take over the module, for example, um, which does happen. People just get busy, they move on, they change to WordPress or whatever, and they just never bother to update the module anymore. Um, but yeah, if it's core, then it's probably more likely that it's just not been noticed, but indeed, it might be that the maintainer just hasn't had time. So you can also suggest to add yourself to the maintainers for the, for the, uh, the, issue, for the module. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question regarding um, uh, people or developers who are willing to contribute after working like I myself, am somebody like that, mm -hmm. uh, having worked f uh, in Drupal for more than a decade, but now they are into uh, planning to have um, uh, something in contribution as well. So are they also considered newbies by uh, the Drupal community developers or uh, there is some other tag for them? And no, the, the, so th it's not really a newbie d tag, it's just novice to the process of contributing. If you've already contributed before and you know the process, then you don't need to find a novice issue, but if you haven't gone through the process before, the novice issues are ones that are fairly straightforward to go through all the different steps. So it's sort of somewhat accomplishable in, a w in like an event like today compared to like something maybe more complex that you're happy to work on, but might take three weeks during which other people are checking things and so on. So the novice issues normally are things that, especially the ones that are marked for the conference, are things that we think that you could maybe get done today during the mentored contribution and um, rather than, than like an ongoing work. The idea is that once you've done one of these small um, tasks, that then you can continue contributing later on uh, with other tasks and you've just gotten yourself used to that process. Um, so yeah, if you want to work on something else, you can find something in the general contribution as well, the general contribution space. There's teams working on different initiatives and they can help you uh, find something to work on if you're already used to the process. Thank you. Um, so, uh, with notification, or um, sorry, documentation being one of the ways to contribute, um, especially as D7 is being phased out, what is the process to um, help contribute and update the documentation like on the project page itself? On the project page itself, um, if it's the I'm trying to remember if the project page is marked as a community guide or as a curated guide. If it doesn't have an edit, an edit button on it, 
then it'll have an ASCII doc button, at, uh, ASCII doc link at the bottom. Um, if it's one of those with an ASCII doc, basically you have to create a patch change for like a, an update to the ASCII doc and it gets put into an issue in the issue queue and then it gets through the process just like a code change. If it's uh, something where you can click on the edit button, then you would just go through and fill that in and just give a good reason. Um, if there's something that you find that doesn't have either, um, I've not necessarily looked for something like that. There might be something that's locked. There is sometimes you find that there's some, there's some issues that sometimes get locked for some reason or other, and there's no edit on them. There might also be community documentation that gets locked for some reason. And uh, if you reach out to somebody in the hash documentation channel, they'll be able to help you with that. Thank you. I have the same problem like uh, she said like where one of the items that we tried to uh, contribute before is uh, the Arabic translation group okay uh, the manager uh, we think it's gone he he not working anymore for this uh, I write a topic there uh, or create an article in the group itself to ask if anyone can give me even I doesn't need a manager at least I need the mod moderator to approve the translation there but no one replied, so who should where, I... Where did you post that, sorry? Uh, just day morning. No, but where? In uh, the group articles itself, or topics in the group. In the translation group? Yeah. Okay. So no one's replying to you in the translation group? No. No. It might be that there's just nobody else actively in that group. Um, if that's the case, then you might need to reach out to somebody again on Slack. This is why we use Slack, right? There's a lot more people active on Slack than you know where you can reach out. And I think there's there must be a translation group on Slack, I, I, a channel. Sorry, I can't remember which one it would be, but they would be able to help you with that. There's people who are involved with um, maybe giving you a different role and things like that, where you'd have more uh, the ability to to make those changes. There we go. Already, already making connections, awesome. Um, so yeah, so after, I think lunch is gonna be in a moment. There's one more question over here, oh, right? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Lunch is not yet, you gotta hear some more questions. Uh, oh, sorry. Why did you come to this workshop today? Maybe you were like, oh, I wanna give back to Drupal, or maybe you're like, oh, there's this problem on this website that I wanna fix, that I'm working on. Or maybe you're like, oh, I want to just learn more about my area of expertise. And you just heard all this, and you're probably thinking, wow, that is a little bit complicated, and I only got like 10% of that. That's OK. Come on downstairs. People, us, us mentors, we will help you figure things out a little bit more. We don't know all 100% of it either, so we're just going to sit down with you, work through stuff together, and let's figure it out. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the whole process of doing this today is to demystify the process of contributing. Um, we'll be get stepping through all of the processes with you, and if there's something that we don't know, we'll take you to find somebody who does know, and we'll together learn how to fix that problem. Um, it's a great way of also making new connections with people that maybe you've seen you know, on stage or you know, ma making issue comments and stuff, and you, oh, okay, now I finally get to meet them, and they can help you resolve something. Um, so that will all be happening downstairs in the mentor contribution space in uh, 113, B113. I think there's, yeah, there's some time to go downstairs and get set up. There'll be a lunch, but uh, it's probably good to go downstairs now and get set up and find groups and find tables to work on. There's the Project Browser initiative. Leslie's there and she's got a ton of issues to work on for Project Browser. Um, she's got like really good, clear, concise tasks to work on. But yeah, there'll be you know, teams who are working on documentation, on code, on marketing efforts, all sorts. And if you've got something else that you'd like to propose to work on today, feel free to propose it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there more questions? Well, not so much a question, but there are a lot more people in here than will fit in those rooms. So I think Amy June is trying to commandeer this room to okay. have extra mentoring contrib space. What? Forget oh. everything I just said. 
I'm going to take another lap. <laughs> Great. Oh, another question over here. Sorry. Yes, so I was looking at the uh, Drupal issue queue, and um, I was noticing the issue tags, and there was the thing where, you know, use the autocomplete, rely on that. Is there a list of all of the tags that are available currently anywhere for us to see? In the event we don't know the right Good question. Tag uh, is there a list of all the issue tags? I'm not sure that we have access to them. I know that there is a list, and that uh, the moderators for the site can delete issue tags, but... Is there a way to view all the issue tags? Well, the other auto complete. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's what we normally do is we just go, oh, yeah. it, does this tag exist? And we start to type it out. You're, uh, you're probably talking about thousands. And so if you were even to get that list, you'd lose your, you'd lose your mind. <laughs> so the auto complete is your friend, and you should just zero in on the, the tag you're looking for. I hope that helps. It's not, you know, a comprehensive list that you can, list, you know, click through, but uh, it's what it is <laughs> for now until we move to GitLab. Maybe we can add a task to create a list. <laughs> uh, so if you talk to anybody from <laughs> <laughs> from the Drupal Association, the, the, the dev team working on Drupal.org you'll know that any changes, like we've tried to make changes to some of the elements in the issue queue. It's a big task to make any changes. And now everything is getting migrated. Um, the whole issue queue is going to get migrated so to GitLab. So all that stuff would be kind of a massive undertaking for a very little time period. It's an opportunity in GitLab. It would be, be accessible. I was almost thinking just type A, see what's in there, copy that. Paste it in, type B, see oh, what's in there, copy I mean, that. you could go ahead and do <laughs> that. Do Somebody that is going to be questioning you about your sanity afterwards, <laughs> but you could do it. I don't know. Yeah, that's, I'm weird. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, more questions. Sorry, I keep, I keep telling you that it's all over and then there's more questions. But you can leave if you want to, but these questions are great. So thank you for making them. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, this is a quick one. Just um, I've had a Drupal.org account for about a year, just kind of reporting issues. What is some um, advice on getting uh, confirmed as a user, just meeting up with mentors here or contributing to projects? Anybody who's got their hand up can confirm a user. So Excellent. there's four of us in this room. Let's see who gets to you first. Excellent. Thank you. More questions? Awesome questions. This is great. Okay, this is a very basic question, but um, on an issue page, there's the create issue fork button and a checkbox next to it with the, whether or not you want to make a new branch with a name. Is there a reason why you wouldn't check that box? Um, so, yes. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you. Hang on. If it's a no code issue. If you're yeah, so. On somebody else's patch. Basically, you ideally for most of these things, you would have a branch. We don't want you just creating empty issue forks. Um, but in some instances, there is an edge case where you do need to create uh, an issue fork without a branch. Um, I think a no-code issue requires an issue fork. But um, yeah, meta issues. meta issues and things like that, you might still want to fork. But in most cases, you do need to create the branch. So if in doubt, just create the branch. Any more questions? I think everybody's satiated with questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Really excited to see how many have turned up today. And we're really excited to see you contributing downstairs later on. Thank you.